At approximately 10.30 p.m. on Saturday, January the 18th, 1986, a security guard making rounds at Saddleback College in Mission Viejo, California, spotted a figure lying in one of the student parking lots along the campus's western perimeter. According to the Orange County Weekly, it was dark and, at first, he thought perhaps it was a mannequin that a student may have left there as a prank. The poorly lit parking lot made it difficult to tell for sure. At first, he simply drove past, but moments later, having second thoughts, he turned around and headed back to the nearly deserted area where the whitish figure lay. Getting out of his car, the security guard noticed that the figure was lying on the pavement next to a Chevrolet Citation. However, as he approached it, he saw that it was lying in a pool of blood and suddenly realized that it wasn't a mannequin at all. It was the dead body of a young woman. Two students on the way to their cars saw the gruesome scene as well. They recognized the young woman. She was Robin Brandley, 23 a communications major who had left a party in the Fine Arts Building just minutes earlier. There was a music recital at which Brandley had volunteered as an usher, and the party had immediately followed the recital. Brandley wore a long print dress with flower designs, but it was pulled up above her stomach, revealing bikini underwear and knee-high stockings. A purse, later determined to be Brandley's, lay on the pavement nearby. The asphalt around her body was wet with blood, Detective Michael Stephanie of the Orange County Sheriff's Department was among the first law enforcement officials to arrive at the scene. Stephanie observed immediately that Brandley was stabbed numerous times, mostly in her neck, chest, and back. He also noted that she sustained cuts to her hands, which he theorized were defensive wounds. There was little evidence other than Brandley's body and her blood. No other DNA, fingerprints, hair, or clothing fibers were found at the crime scene for Stephanie and his colleagues to work with. An autopsy would show that Brandley was stabbed 41 times, but the brutal murder would remain a mystery for the next 11 years. On July 17, 1988, Julie McGee, 29, and a prostitute, disappeared after being picked up by an unknown male in the Cathedral City area of Riverside County. Her remains, stripped of identification, were later found in a remote desert area. Identifying her body was made more difficult by the mutilation of her body by coyotes and possibly other animals. Cartridge cases for a 45 caliber handgun were found near McGee's body. McGee's slaying was initially investigated as a single, isolated homicide. Two months later, on September 25, 1988, another prostitute, Marianne Wells, 31, was picked up by someone in nearby San Diego County and driven to a deserted industrial complex within the city of San Diego. Her body was later found, shot once in the head. As in McGee's death, a cartridge case was left behind at the scene of Wells's murder. A condom found at the location had Wells's DNA on it, as well as the DNA from another person, believed to be the killer's. But the stranger's DNA did not immediately lead anywhere. By the time of the next slaying some seven months later, again in Riverside County, investigators began to see the links between the deaths. On April 16, 1989, another prostitute, Tammy Irwin, 20, was picked up and driven to a remote area near Palm Springs, where she was shot three times and her body dumped. Again, investigators found cartridge cases near the body. Investigators from Riverside and San Diego counties began comparing notes. They realized they had a serial killer on their hands. Ballistic tests showed that the cartridge cases from the McGee, Wells, and Irwin murder scenes all matched. Each of the women was killed with the same gun, but they lacked, at this point, both the weapon and a suspect to whom they could link it. But there was no link between the prostitute shootings and the murder of Robin Brandley. The victim contrasts were too great. Brandley wasn't a prostitute. She was a college student. Brandley also had not been shot. She was repeatedly stabbed. For the next three and a half years, there were no additional murders that police could attribute to the same killer. Jennifer S. Benson, 19, a nursing assistant in Palm Springs, worked the night shift at a home for disabled children. On September 27, 1992, according to S. Benson and CBS News, she went to a bus stop to catch a bus that would drop her near the children's home. She first went to a store to make a purchase, but when she returned, she saw the last bus for the night leave without her. In a panic, she knew that she did not have a way to get to work. Moments later, a man pulled up in a car and asked S. Benson if he could give her a ride. He did not seem threatening and seemed like a good Samaritan, so she accepted the ride. She said that she didn't feel any sense of fear and thought he was so nice and charming. Although he made a few advances toward her, he dropped her off for work in time for her shift, which ran from 10 p.m. until 6 a.m. 
The man was waiting outside the children's home the following day when as Benson got off work. She told police and reporters that she was not frightened by the man, who said, let me give you a ride home. Her thoughts were that the man was not dangerous and that if he wanted to do something to her, he could have done it the evening before. As a result, she accepted the ride, again. Once inside the car, however, things were much different this time. He put a knife to her throat, tied her hands behind her back, and drove her into the desert. When they arrived at the remote location, as Benson's nightmare intensified, he cut off her shorts and bra and shoved her underwear into her mouth. Afterward, he tried to have non-consensual sex with her. He then strangled her until she passed out. When she regained consciousness, he opened the car door and told her to get out, but held her back by yanking on her hair. He then forced her into the car's trunk and drove off. Convinced that she was going to die, as Benson desperately searched for the trunk's release mechanism, when she found it, she waited for what seemed like the right moment and jumped out onto the road. After several cars would not stop for her, she stood in the street in front of a marine truck and forced it to stop. When her abductor saw the two marines helping her, he fled, she said. The marines drove her to safety, and she reported her terrifying ordeal to the police. Two and a half years later, on March 11, 1995, again in the Palm Springs area, the elusive and as yet unidentified serial killer claimed yet another victim. Denise Maney, 32, a Riverside County prostitute, was picked up from a street and driven to a remote desert area. According to police and court records, Maney disrobed, after which the killer tied her hands behind her back. After having non-consensual sex with Manny, the killer placed a 45 caliber gun in her mouth and blew the back of her head off. Following his modus operandi, the killer took her clothes with him and left her body in the desert. On April 14, 1996, Halfway across the nation, in Cook County, Illinois, a prostitute was picked up off the street and driven to the Wolf Lake area straddling the Hammond, Indiana and Chicago border. Sometime during the ordeal, Laura Ulaki was shot twice in the head with a 38 caliber revolver, and afterward, her killer threw her nude body into Wolf Lake, where it was later found on the Chicago side of the lake. Police theorized that the killer had taken the victim's clothing and other items to hamper their efforts in identifying her. However, police in Illinois did not connect the murder with those in California. Three months later, the killer struck again, also in Illinois. On July 14, 1996, the nude body of Cassandra Cassie Corum, 21, another prostitute, was found floating in the Vermilion River in Livingston County, Illinois, near the town of Pontiac. Duct tape was placed over her mouth, and she was shot once in the head. An autopsy later showed that she was also stabbed seven times in the chest and head. Her wrists were handcuffed, and duct tape was also used to bind her ankles. Coram had disappeared from a bar in Hammond, Indiana, after conversing with a man and had left with him after getting into his pickup truck. The following month, on August 2, 1996, the nude body of Lynn Huber, 22, of Chicago, was found floating in Wolf Lake, only a few yards from where Laura Ulaki's body was found in the spring. Like most other victims, Huber was a prostitute, and the killer had left none of the victim's clothing or identification near the murder scene. On November 14, 1996, Hammond, Indiana Patrol Officer Warren Fryer stopped a man driving a pickup truck after observing that the driver was parked outside a suspected crack house on the 800 block of Becker Street with a prostitute known to the police. As a precaution, Fryer called for backup and waited for additional police to arrive before moving on the suspicious person. When officers approached the pickup, according to Fryer, the driver, Andrew Erdialis, 31, was cooperative. As Fryer spoke with him and Erdialis explained that he served in the Marines, he noticed a revolver inside the pickup and loudly yelled, gun, to his fellow officers. The revolver, retrieved by another officer, was a snub-nosed, chrome-plated 38 Special, and the officer noted that it was fully loaded with six bullets. Since Erdialis did not have a permit for the gun, he was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon, and the revolver was confiscated. As the pickup was being prepared to be towed, Fryer and the other officers noted that the vehicle, inside and out, was spotlessly clean. Fryer also noted that the truck bed and the cab were as clean as you would wash the outside of your car, as if they'd come out of the showroom. Rolls of duct tape were also found inside the vehicle. Erdy Alice was soon released on the concealed weapon charge, but was later convicted of a misdemeanor for the unauthorized possession of a handgun. On April 1, 1997, Officer Fryer received a call about a man and a woman fighting at a motel, then known as the American Inn at 4000 Calumet Avenue in Hammond. According to police, Erdialis told an officer that the woman, 
a prostitute, had stolen something from him. The prostitute, however, also known to the police, told Fryer that Erdialis was kind of kinky and that the altercation arose because Erdialis had wanted to take the woman to Wolf Lake, handcuff her in the back of his pickup truck, and have sex with her. Fryer told the prostitute, Geez, don't do that. We're finding girls up there dead. Fryer wrote a police report about the incident and filed it, but did not arrest Erdialis or the woman. Instead, he later ran a computer check on Erdialis that encompassed known infractions involving him and Hammond, including the November 1996 incident involving the unauthorized possession of a handgun. Fryer then wrote a supplemental report that included all of the information he knew about Erdialis to date and forwarded it to the detective division. Because Fryer had made the Wolf Lake connection to the murdered prostitutes, copies of the report were in turn forwarded to homicide detectives with the Chicago Police Department, CPD, hoping that the information might be helpful to them. Following their review of the documents, CPD detective Don McGrath asked Hammond police for Erdie Alice's confiscated revolver. Upon receipt of the weapon, McGrath took it to a gun expert. After a thorough examination, the ballistics test results showed that it was the same gun used to kill Laura Ulaki, Cassandra Corum, and Lynn Huber. McGrath knew for sure that he had a serial killer on his hands. On the morning of April 22, 1997, a Tuesday, McGrath and his partner, Detective Raymond Krakowski, began a stakeout in an alley near Erdi Alice's parents' home, where Erdi Alice had resided following his discharge from the Marine Corps years earlier. It was a working-class neighborhood where modest bungalows and duplexes lined the streets and where the murder suspect's parents had lived for more than 10 years. As luck would have it, McGrath and Krakowski did not have to wait very long. Erdi Alice came out at approximately 9 a.m., leaving for his job as a security guard at a downtown Chicago Eddie Bauer store. The two detectives walked up to Erdi Alice and told him that they needed to speak to him about the incident in November 1996 in which his gun was confiscated. Erdi Alice politely told them that the case was resolved, but the detectives insisted that there was unfinished business regarding the 38 caliber revolver. After minimal hesitation, he agreed to accompany the two detectives to their offices. At one point, McGrath asked Erdi Alice where he obtained the gun, and he told him that he purchased it about five years earlier in Calumet City for $300. When asked if it had ever been out of his possession, he said that it had not, and stated that it was under his exclusive control until Hammond police officers had confiscated it. At another point during the questioning, McGrath indicated that he and his partners were investigating some unsolved crimes, shooting deaths to be precise, involving a 38 caliber gun, and showed him photos of Ulaki, Coram, and Huber. At first, Erdi Alice said that he did not recognize the three women. But when McGrath told him that the bullets used in their murders matched his gun, he paused for a moment and then responded that he guessed he would not be going to work that day. He took off his security badge, loosened his tie, and began untying his shoelaces. He then provided the detectives with details of his murders of Ulaki, Coram, and Huber. Without any additional prompting from the police, Erdi Alice also said that there were some matters that police in California might be interested in. Up until that point, police in neither state had connected the earlier murders in California to those in Illinois. Erdi Alice explained to McGrath and Krakowski that he met Laura Ulaki sometime during the winter of 1996 and that they'd gone out on dates a few times. According to court records, he said that they'd had sex on two occasions at Wolf Lake, using a sleeping bag Early Alice said he kept in the back of his truck. It was in April 1996, he said, that he picked up Ulaki, and they again went to Wolf Lake. Along the way, an argument broke out between them. When they arrived at Wolf Lake, Erdi Alice took his 38 caliber revolver, which was loaded, from beneath the driver's seat and was showing it to Laura when it went off and shot a hole in the roof of his pickup. Laura got mad and all hell broke loose, Erdi Alice told the cops. Erdi Alice said that Ulaki had attempted to grab his gun and had broken his left index finger during the struggle. Unable to gain control of the situation, Ulaki had jumped out of the truck and had tried to run away. Following her, Erdi Alice said he fired a couple of rounds in Ulaki's direction as he chased her. After she fell to the ground, Erdi Alice went over to her and determined that she was dead. It was then, he said, that he decided to toss her body into the lake. Before throwing her body in the lake, Erdi Alice said, he undressed her and took her clothes with him. He said he had thrown the clothes out of the truck from the passenger side on the drive back to Chicago. Erdi Alice then told the detectives about the murder of Lynn Huber, his seventh murder victim, whom he met during the summer of 1996. Huber, he said, was working as a prostitute in Chicago. As with Ulaki, 
Erdialis said he and Huber had sex on two occasions. On an evening in late July or early August 1996, Erdialis said that he saw Huber carrying a large garbage bag and that he stopped and offered her a ride, and she accepted. The detectives recalled that Huber's body was found on August 2, 1996. As Erdialis continued with his account, he said he drove into an alley where he and Huber could have sex. He claimed she had begun arguing with them and started acting kind of ditzy before trying to get out of the truck. Erdialis said that he had grabbed her and shot her in the head with the gun kept under the driver's seat. After he'd killed her, Erdialis said, he placed her body in the bed of the truck and driven it to Wolf Lake. As he removed Huber's clothing, he said, he pricked his finger with a needle. He said that pricking his finger had made him angry, prompting him to take a knife and stabbing the body. He said that he stabbed Huber a lot of times in the back and afterward he'd shot her again. He then took her nude body, threw it in the lake, and left the garbage bag that Huber was carrying. After examining its contents and discovering that it contained clothing, Erdialis took the clothes that Huber was wearing, along with the clothing in the plastic bag, and gave them all to the Salvation Army because Huber won't need them anymore. In describing what McGrath and Krakowski would conclude was their serial killer's eighth and final victim, Erdialis said he had known Cassandra Corum for about two years before killing her on July 13, 1996. After meeting each other at a bar in Hammond, Indiana, the couple had driven to Wolf Lake to have sex. Her body was found the next day floating in the lake. At one point that evening, Erdialis said, Corum had said something that angered him. He couldn't remember what, resulting in him striking Corum in the face several times with his hand and fist. Erdialis's anger, the cops noted, seemed to be a recurring theme. Frightened by this violence, Corum panicked and began to fight back, which is what had prompted him to handcuff her hands behind her back. Erdialis had then removed her clothing and described Corum as seeming numb with anxiety and fear and passive and submissive. He then bound her feet with duct tape and placed duct tape over her mouth. He said that he was still pissed off about whatever Corum had said that had angered him as he was driving south on Interstate 55 with a terrified, bound and gagged naked woman lying on the front seat who was about to be killed. After driving for about two hours, Erdialis recalled, he began to get tired and decided to exit the interstate. He continued driving, however, and eventually crossed a bridge that led to a small park where he stopped and shut off the truck's engine. He said that he and Corm had got out of the truck and he grabbed his gun from beneath the seat on the way out. After walking to the back of the truck, Corum, still naked, had turned to face Erdialis as if she planned to say something when Erdialis shot her, according to court documents. After she'd fallen to the ground, Erdialis said, he, still angry with Corum for the earlier altercation, had taken out his knife and stabbed her a few times. Afterward, he dropped her body into the river from the nearby bridge and threw her clothing out the window as he drove toward home. As he explained, he was trained to kill in the Marine Corps. He claimed he did not feel any sympathy for Cassie. She was just a bimbo, he said. Andrew Erdialis was described as a loner and as someone who had difficulty engaging in small talk. He graduated from Thornridge High School in Dalton, Illinois in 1982 and was given the graduating senior label of social outcast. He had a few friends and joined the U.S. Marine Corps a short time after completing high school and was stationed at Camp Pendleton and other locales in Southern California over the next eight years. Erdialis also claimed to have fallen in love with a 15-year-old girl whom he had gotten pregnant. He said that marriage was out of the question because he was fearful of the girl's parents and what the Marine Corps might have done to him in a judicial or disciplinary sense, because of the girl's age. As a result, they had both agreed that the girl would get an abortion. I loved her and still love her, Erdialis later told a psychiatry professor at Yale University. But the law and the state of California and the righteous and the Marine Corps might not see it that way. Background information and testimony at trial later on showed significant evidence of mental illness on both sides of Erdialis's family, that he was abused by relatives, and that he was physically and emotionally abused by his parents, according to court records. Erdialis received several promotions during his military service, but was later demoted when those under his leadership refused to obey his orders. Killing four women during his Southern California military service, he received an honorable discharge in 1991 and returned to Chicago to live with his parents. Erdialis returned to California in September 1992 for a short visit in which he attacked Jennifer as Benson but returned to Chicago again. In March 1995, while vacationing in Palm Springs, he took the life of Denise Manny, his fifth known California murder victim. When Erdialis made his confession to the detectives and led them through essential details of each of the killings, 
he claimed that college student Robin Brandley was his first murder victim, according to court documents. Stationed at Camp Pendleton near San Diego, Erdialis recounted, he became upset regarding relationships with some of the people on the base and decided that he wanted to rob someone. He armed himself with a big old hunting knife, about 11 inches long, and had driven to Saddleback College, where he waited in a darkened parking lot for a victim. He explained that the victim could have been anybody and that the victim he chose was just a random female. The victim had turned out to be Robin Brandley. After seeing her, he crept up behind her and placed his hand over her mouth, demanding her purse. After she gave it to him, he began stabbing her in the back, he said. When she fell to the pavement, Erdialis started to stab her in the chest. At one point, the knife had become stuck in her ribs, and in order for him to remove it, he had to place his foot on her body and brace it while he struggled to extract the knife. Erdialis said he left the young woman there to die when he finished. With blood on his hands, jacket and jeans, Erdialis said, he knew he had to get back on the base undetected. He subsequently rubbed grease from his car's engine on his hands and clothes to conceal the blood and told military police at the guard station at the base's entrance that his car had broken down and that he'd had to make repairs. Erdialis told the detectives that he later picked up a prostitute in Hollywood with whom he'd had sex and was carrying the same knife he'd used to kill Brandley. That prostitute, he said, was lucky. According to court records that detailed his confession to the two detectives, Erdialis said he had killed Julie McGee, 29, on July 17, 1988, in Cathedral City, California, near Palm Springs, and that was his second murder victim. He described how he picked up McGee in an area frequented by prostitutes and drove her to a remote construction site, out in the desert, where they had sex. A short time later, he told McGee to get out of his car, after which he shot her in the head, he said. He claimed that he didn't feel anything after committing the murder and commented about how quiet and peaceful it was in the desert where he shot McGee. Afterward, he said, he drove to a bar where he drank some beers and watched the girls dance. Two months later, on September 25, 1988, Erdialis said he picked up Marianne Wells and had driven her to an industrial area in San Diego where they had had sex. Afterward, he said, he shot her in the head and had taken back the $40 he paid to her and had dumped her body in an alley where it was later found, along with the condom he left behind. The following spring, on April 16, 1989, Erdialis said he picked up prostitute Tammy Irwin, with whom he'd had sex on at least one prior occasion, and had driven her to a vacant lot near Palm Springs where she performed oral sex on him. Erdialis said that he did not recall having argued with Irwin as he had argued with some of his other victims, but he did remember shooting her as she stood outside his truck as he prepared to leave. He was inside the pickup when he shot her, and as she stood there holding her head, he shot her a second time, which brought her to the ground. Before he drove off, he said, he shot her a third time. In one part of his confession, Erdialis described to the detectives the ordeal through which he put Jennifer as Benson before deciding that he would attempt to kill her. He said that after offering as Benson a ride to work that fateful September evening in 1992, he asked her for her telephone number, and she gave him one. The problem was, he said, it was a bum number that wasn't hers. He tried calling her after dropping her off at work. He stewed about it during the night, and, while waiting for her to get off work so he could offer to take her to breakfast and give her a ride home, he said he began feeling upset about the number or something. Something was just kind of building up, you know, tension. He remained nonetheless and made his offer, which she accepted. At one point, while they were driving, Erdialis said he reached over and grabbed his Benson by her hair and showed her a gun, after which she became pretty much submissive from that part forward. He forced her to turn around, called her many unpleasant names, and tied her hands behind her back. I think, he said, before we started moving, after I tied her hands up, I reached over and I kissed her. I just put my lips on her mouth and then I just started, you know, I was just trying to make out with her. Erdialis, at another point, forced as Benson to perform oral sex on him, according to court documents that depict many of Erdialis' statements to the police. However, Erdialis failed to obtain an erection, both when he forced as Benson, who feared for her life, to perform oral sex and when he attempted to have non-consensual sex with her after cutting off her clothes and undergarments. Livid, Erdialis began to choke as Benson. She kept kicking and her saliva was coming out of her mouth. Her face was turning blue and then red. It was just a battle for a while. After his hand had become tired from choking her, Erdialis said he forced his Benson out of the car and threatened her so that she would make another oral sex attempt. Failing again in that regard, 
he said he forced his Benson into the trunk of his car and had driven off. When his Benson had escaped, he said his first thought was to shoot her, but he drove away instead because of the presence of too many other vehicles on the roadway. So that was the last time I saw her, Erdialis told the detectives. I don't know if someone else picked her up and finished what I started. However, in contrast to Erdialis' version of events, as Benson testified in court that Erdialis was successful in his attempt to have non-consensual sex with her after cutting off her clothes. Three years after the kidnapping and attempted murder of Jennifer as Benson, Erdialis returned to Palm Springs for a vacation in March 1995 and picked up prostitute Denise Manny in the same area where he previously picked up McGee and Irwin, according to court documents. Erdialis described how he drove Manny into the desert, eventually turning off onto a deserted side road where he stopped and ordered her to take off her clothes and perform oral sex on him. After getting tired of the oral sex, he said, he grabbed Manny by her hair and forced her to go to the front of the car and lie face down on the ground. After tying her hands behind her back, he forced her to perform fellatio again. Because he wasn't feeling really satisfied, he forced her onto her knees and sodomized her with his fingers, causing her to scream from the pain. And that went on for a while, he said. I just kept doing that to her. Tired of abusing Manny, he forced her to walk toward the desert. At one point they stopped, she turned around, and he pushed the gun into her mouth. And then it went off, he related. He said it blew off the back of Manny's head. Then she fell, and she was still gurgling, making a lot of noises. He got back in his car and started to drive away, but stopped and returned to where Manny lay dying. I didn't really think, he said. I just kind of, like, wiped clean my hand, and I stopped, turned around, and went back to her. By this time, he said, he became angry and very upset and took out his knife. When he described his next actions, he began using both the singular pronoun I and the plural pronoun we, prompting some people, including Robin Brandley's relatives, to later question whether he may have been assisted by another person in carrying out his gruesome crimes. We took the knife out, and we went back toward to where she was lying. We just started stabbing for some reason, he told the cops, according to court records. Just on the body several times, in the chest maybe, stomach, I remember I made a slashing motion by the throat. Then we went back to the car. And I, we, we picked up her clothes. Then we were driving. We just started driving. Erdialis went to trial in Cook County, Illinois in 2002 for the murders of Laura Ulaki and Lynn Huber and was convicted of first-degree murder in both cases. He was sentenced to death. Erdialis's case became a political issue for a short time. After a study by Northwestern University concluded that some death row inmates were innocent and that innocence no longer could be judicially recognized, the governor of Illinois, George Ryan, determined on January 11, 2003, that all 167 people sentenced to death in Illinois at that time would have their sentences commuted to life imprisonment. Erdialis also fell under this commutation. Within hours of Illinois Governor Ryan's decision to commute Erdialis's death sentence in that state, prosecutors in Orange County, California sought to extradite Erdialis to be tried in California for the murders of five women in the 1980s, when Erdialis was stationed at Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton and after he was discharged from the military. In July 2009, under state law that allows for multiple murders connected to one another to be prosecuted together, Prosecutors in California agreed to consolidate the five California murder cases into one, with Senior Deputy District Attorney Howard Gundy of the Orange County District Attorney's Office prosecuting the case. Detective Don McGrath, testifying at Erdialis' sentencing for the murder of Coram, recalled that Erdialis had told him, as he escorted Erdialis back to lockup on one occasion, that he was happy that he was caught. Well, you know, I'm kind of glad in a way that you caught me, McGrath quoted Erdialis. I was starting to get the urge again. On May 23, 2018, Erdialis was convicted in the murders of five Southern California women. On Wednesday, June 13, 2018, a jury rendered a death verdict for Erdialis. The jury deliberated for one day. On October 5, 2018, Erdialis was again sentenced to death, this being his third time. On Friday, November 2, 2018, at around 11.15 p.m., Erdialis was found unresponsive in his cell in the Adjustment Center of San Quentin State Prison. Erdialis was alone in his cell, and prison officials say the apparent cause of death was suicide by hanging. He was 54 years old.